inside the frame and they work their flight muscles and create heat. Well, the bees that are in between the frames are insulators. They fold their wings together and hold that heat and they, they cause that frame to become a heat sink. And it is like a radiant heater, almost. Well, sooner or later, these bees run out of energy. So they have to come out and go to food. And these bees become the, you know, the insulators hadn't been using any energy. They become the heater bees. The heater bees go to food, come back, and come. They just trade places, pretty much. And that's what you see in the winter cluster. If you take a hive apart, it'll look like it's just working. Well, that, that's what you're seeing, is, is the trade out and because they're, they're constantly changing places. When they run out of food, they run out of fuel, these bees, you know, the, the, the heater bees go up and there's no food. And they die as insulators. They come back and they're insulators. And when, because they're insulators, they die from lack of energy. And these bees can't get out of the cells and they die from lack of energy. And it, it's not really freezing to death and it's not really starving to death, it's just dying from running out of energy. I mean, it is because they didn't have any food. And they didn't have any food because it got cold enough that, I mean, there's some truth to both sides of it, but neither, neither explanation is 100% right. They just couldn't get the food. Because it was too cold within the cluster. You know, outside the cluster was too cold. And in, the, in 1900, they thought, well, the heat's all convecting away from them, they're freezing to death. Not really, they're just getting away from food. And the singles wouldn't freeze to death. Okay, we're gonna try it. I've, I've uh, I told some guys up in Indiana, uh, in northern Indiana, about this, northern Illinois. Uh, and they were like, we're gonna try it, man, we're gonna be mad at you. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, I don't go up there very often. <laughs> I try to stay south of the Ohio River as much as I can. And uh, so uh, I did happen to go up there this year to a beekeeper school in uh, Bedford, Indiana. And one of the guys came up, and I thought, oh man, here it comes. <laughs> and, he come up and he said, I've got to tell you, I didn't think that was going to work at all. He said, those are the only hives I had to live. Really? He, he said, I had, I, I lost 16 double deeps. And he said, uh, the way that it worked out, I had several hives that just didn't have anything on them. And I could consolidate them into a single. And they just didn't have anything on them going into the winter. He said, I had about 60 that were in singles. And uh, he said, I didn't lose one single hive like that. I said, well, don't expect that again. <laughs> because, I mean, you should you should have had some of those that died. <laughs> I mean, there's no reason to expect 60 out of 60 to live and 16 out of 16 to die. And, and uh, he said, no, I just have to tell you that I, I didn't think it would work. And I said, well, when I started doing it, I didn't need it. Because uh, I, I wouldn't, I would do a few. Every, you know, for and I did that for six or seven years before I started just really trying to break everything down into singles going into the winter. But when do you start giving them the patty? You know, what what month? Well, uh, I I feed bees a lot because I raise a lot of queens, and those hives are beat up so bad all summer long that they need feeding all summer long. And because I'm, I'm breaking brood cycles all summer long by taking bees out, moving bees, and moving frames of bees, and, and dequeening hives, and stealing brood to make and bees to make cell builders and mating nukes. So they're so disrupted, they can't really do a lot of foraging. So I'm feeding those bees all summer long. Now, our honey producers, they have their own one single with honey supers over them. We take the honey supers off after the first frost. Okay. When everything stops, because on, on the Mississippi River, uh, that's where most of our honey producers are. And there's a pretty good honey flow right up until we have a, a hard frost there. And after that hard frost, 
I'll take all the honey off and put a patty on and, and mm -hmm. get them ready for winter then. And that can be anywhere from 1st of November to mid-December okay. where we live. But uh, last year, last year our first hard frost was a week before Halloween. Mm -hmm. So we uh, that's that's when we when we take the honey off. That's when we winterize everything on the river. But our queen producing hives, I break them down when I quit raising queens. I, I start breaking them down, and that's usually around mid September. I'll I'll stop all the queen rearing and. Uh, break everything down but they've been being fed all summer so it's kind of like they're used to it but I almost never feed liquid that that same patty I use it in the summer too because these hives are going to be anywhere from big boiling over hives down to a two frame mating nuke and the big boiling over hives, if you feed a two frame mating nuke with liquid, they'll kill it. Mm -hmm. but just in a matter of a day, they'll kill it. But they, bees will rob liquid, but they, but they won't rob solid. Okay. You can put that solid patty in there and they won't rob it. So you can feed small hives that are sitting next to big hives this solid patty, the same recipe that I gave you. Uh, you can feed them this solid patty anytime during the summer and they'll live, but they, they won't get robbed out, robbed out and killed. So I'm feeding, I'm feeding that stuff all summer. And when we go into winter, you know, it's, it's just a natural, a natural switch. You know, that all this changing, the feed's not changing for them. It's just that I'm putting them down into different boxes and putting queens. I, I split and fill up, try to fill up all the equipment I can. Um, when I quit raising queens. And <clears throat> I'll use the last round of queens that I raised filling up empty equipment. And I nearly always have you know, 25, 30, sometimes a few more doubles where I just didn't have enough queens to make all the splits or I ran out of equipment one or the other. And so I always have some doubles. Every year, I'll lose 30 to 40% of those doubles over the winter exactly the way I described. Dead bees that far from honey. And I, I lose between five and ten percent of the samples. All of them don't live, but most of them do. I'm way more successful than uh, winter in them than I am doubles. Plus it gives you more honey <laughs> to sell. You guys just heard about how valuable local honey is. It gives you more honey to sell. <laughs> Yeah. I've got an information overload on this. This is really cool. We're starting. Do you have references or do you have a website that we can read some of this? No, I, I had a website and uh, I didn't have sense enough to know how to add stuff to it and change stuff. So I'm still paying for this stupid website because I'm too ignorant to figure out how to cancel it. But uh, <laughs> it's there and and you can get directions to my house on it. You can get my phone number, my address, but it says like nukes are like 80 bucks or something like that. The nukes are not $80 anymore. <laughs> no, that was the price of a nuke back in the 90s. One time Sunday dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You get, you get there after 12 o'clock at noon on Sunday. We're going to be eating sometime Sunday afternoon. So All right. Get there early enough to visit a while and food will be ready before long. His wife is an excellent cook. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have a bee beekeeper school at our house every year in April. And uh, it, this next year it'll be April 11, 12, and 13. Three day school. It's 9A to 5P. Stay as late as you want to. Get there as early as you want to. It don't cost anything. You get lots of really good food. We do everything from lighting smokers, teaching people how to light a smoker, to teaching people how to dissect bees and make slides and look for nosemia. So well, how do you advertise this bee school? How does anyone know? Totally word of mouth. We have so we have about uh, anywhere from 150 to 200 people per day. There, it's on our farm. It's all, it's working in live bees all day long. 
we we focus mostly on queen rearing because that's what we do and we'll show you three or four different methods of raising queens of course i focus on the way that i raise queens but we have other other people that do it different for folks that don't graft or don't grafting is way easier than you think it is isn't it yes <laughs> Once he shows you how to graft, it's like walking. Really? Yeah, it, it is really. I mean, it, uh, does somebody advertise it on their Facebook page? Yeah, uh, okay. Lake Barkley Beekeepers. Lake B A R K L E Y. Lake Barkley. Lake Barkley. Beekeepers. They have a Facebook page, and um, there's a business in Paducah called the Bee Barn. They have a website, and it will probably be on their website too. The guy that runs what's the name of the town? Paducah. How do you spell that? P A D. P. P. A D. Paducah. Paducah. U C A H. They used to say it was because there was a, a chief Padu was the local chieftain of the Indians there, and then somebody figured out that no Indian was ever named that. That, that was just what somebody, some, somebody heard. that was what, what some white guy thought an Indian ought to be named, you know. They even have a big wood carving out in uh, the main cemetery in Paducah of Chief Paduk. I mean, it's like a laughing stock now. You go over there and say, yeah, Chief Paduk, yeah, good idiot. Wasenthal Wasson was the real chief of the time. I mean, somebody went back in, in some historical documents and found out that uh, Andrew Jackson dealt with a Chickasaw chief named Wasenthal. There wasn't ever any Chief Paduke. I don't know where the name Paducah came from. Excuse me, but is that in Tennessee? Kentucky. Kentucky. Way, new around here. Wait, that's sorry. okay. Way west in Kentucky. Okay. Uh, the Mississippi River is about 30 miles from my house. Well, I heard you say Mississippi River, but you could be in Tennessee. True, Mississippi. You're, you're right. In fact, in fact, uh, I raised queens for some Tennessee beekeepers that are on the Mississippi River. They're they're the guys that uh, that help me get contacts down there on the Kentucky side because they have some bee yards in Kentucky. Kentucky has no rules for bees. The only rule is keep your bees. You know the, our state apiarist has no authority at all. It's, it's, it's total, totally an educational office. It's appointed, not uh, not elected. And uh, every time there's an admis administration change in Kentucky, the state apiarist could very well be replaced with somebody's nephew or niece or something. So, if you have if you have fowl brood in Kentucky. The state apers to say what you really should do is burn that. And if you say, well, I ain't burning that, they say, well, you should, but see you later. That, it's not that way. I have bees in Florida and Mississippi and some other places. And it's not that way at all. <laughs> in Mississippi and Florida, they'll actually help you. <laughs> they'll burn it for you if you get a foul brood. <laughs> But, well, you know, we used to live on the um, California-Arizona border, and there was a really big bust of three semis coming in with illegal bees yep. that were heading up to the almonds. Yep. Maybe they were coming from Kentucky without it. No, <laughs> nobody from Kentucky sends bees up there uh, directly from Kentucky. Well, they were unregistered bees, so they got a big bust. I don't know whatever happened to them. Yeah, you, you have, if you send bees across state lines like that, or, or in my case, I sell queens to people that live in other states, right. and I have... What our state apiarist can do is give you a health certificate that's valid in other states. Our state apiarist, uh, that's really the only useful purpose of the office that I see. They, they come and, and inspect your bees and make sure that there's no uh, disease or anything in them and write you a health certificate that, that allows you to sell or move into other states. But even with that health certificate, if I'm going to California, I have to send that first and be approved to come in. They have to look at the health certificate and say, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll yeah, accept it. they were caught sneaking over a farmer's bridge, three semis. <laughs> it was exciting. <laughs> I, I bet it was. 
I bet it was really exciting if you were one of the beekeepers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We wondered what they probably got. Be. They probably got the full tour. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Uh, and, were confiscated. And yeah, like it's oh, too bad man. all those bees are probably just killed or something. Kind of sad. Oh, they probably sold them to somebody. That's some of those that are in bee journal. Bees after almonds, you know. <laughs> they gotta gotta get highway money somehow. Pay for some of this overtime. But I feed solid feed. I don't feed very much liquid feed at all. The only time I'll feed liquid feed is if I'm wanting comb drawn and there's no honey flow. I'll feed two to one sugar syrup to get comb drawn. But if you feed liquid feed, it needs to be on a big hive that's strong enough to keep robbers from taking over. Because if there's not something blooming, if there's not a good bloom out there and you start feeding liquid feed, just asking for trouble. Not so with solid teeth. I don't put any protein in it in the summer, especially because uh, small hive beetles. The only the only time I add protein is on cell builders, and they're only going to be using it for about uh, a day. So I, I put a very small protein patty on cell builders so that they'll have everything they need to. And I feed the cell builder for several days before that I'm going to put queen cell queen cups in it so that they'll be primed and ready to ready to make good cells. And by doing that, you know, they don't uh, small hive beetles don't have a chance to take over. I don't feed them enough of a patty that they can't consume it before the beetles get in there and lay eggs in it. Mm -hmm. They'll really make a mess out of the protein patty. And if you don't get the, if you're not able to come to the beekeeper school at our place, I mean, you camp, you can, we have people camp on the farm. We, last year we had 25 or 30 people out there in the field camping. But uh, there are motels within uh, 20, 30 minutes of the house. And folks think that uh, it's really unhandy for us to live a half an hour from the nearest town that's got a motel. We think we're not quite far enough out. But uh, if you can't come, if you can't make it, uh, some of you get together and come up there on whenever you can. I mean, we have groups come come through the farm all summer long and just want to follow and see how to raise queens. Do you do videos? No, nah, but I don't mind you doing a video while I'm there. Okay. I mean, you, you can do a video or, or tape or whatever you want to do while I'm there. I mean, I, I work with clothes on, so. There you go. I had some bees one time uh, in Canada. That was before they had mites in Canada. And uh, they were so nice. I mean, you just, you never needed any smoke. It was just unreal how nice those bees were to work. Very productive. But it was 20, almost 24 hours from my house to the bee yard. And it, the logistics of it was just impossible because I had bees in Florida, Mississippi, and there. And I had to give up one one or the other ends. And uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. But uh, uh, I was talking to some people at a conference, and Ed Levi used to be the uh, plant plant and animal health guy in Arkansas. That, that was their version of the state acres. And uh, he was there, and he was sitting on the front row. And uh, I said, uh, I was talking about these Canadian bees and how that after I moved them back, at that time you could bring bees back across the border from Canada without any regulation. You couldn't take them the other way, but you could bring them back here. And uh, I was moving bees back, and as the bees became infested with Varroa, they quit being nice. And they, I mean, just right down the row, I had 48 hives, just right down the row, this one was just nasty to, to work through. And then, these two would, and it just, before the summer was out, uh, they were pretty good for the first year. That second year, they got pretty tough, all of them. And uh, I said, uh, now these bees were really nice. They were so nice in Canada. Before they got the royal mites, you could have worked them naked. And uh, Ed, Ed said, uh, 
That's a visual that I did not need. <laughs> But they they were they were like that. Uh, they they were really really nice to work and really productive. But they had no clue whatsoever what to do with a varroa mite. And they I mean they they found new ways to die every day after I got them back to Kentucky. Bad it was a bad genetic to try to raise queens off of. Similar to uh, up until Ray Oliverius moved some bees to California that actually did know what to do with a varroa mite, Hawaiian queens were, were notorious about producing bees that would just flop over dead at the side of a varroa. <laughs> but you can get a queen in February from there, and you can't get one anywhere else in February from there. Treat for Varroa. You guys treat for Varroa? If you treat for Varroa, what do you use? In cool weather. It's a pretty good treatment. You do, you do have some issues with them sometimes. Uh, I mean, I do. I, I've used them before. Uh, but uh, hot weather, you're going to have a lot of issues with them. But in cool weather, it's pretty good. Uh, hot weather, you can use hop guard too it, with honey super zone. It's beta oil from a hot plant and uh, it it won't get in the wax. It's something that you can use with honey super zone. Those are really the only two things that you can use with honey super zone. If you, if you think you're going to have a honey super on within the next six weeks, then those are your options. But the other mite aside, kind of going up the ladder from that, uh, Oxalic acid will kill varroa mites if they're outside the cappings, outside the cells. It won't have any effect on the varroa mites under the cells. And you have oxalic acid, it's a good treatment if there's absolutely no cap brood in the hive. Or if you're, if you're shaking bees, shaking into a package or just using loose bees, it's a good treatment for that. It, it'll rid you of varroa mites. But if there's cap cells, it's not a it's not a good treatment. Uh, the thymol treatments, Apigard and Apolifar, those are good treatments. They they work. And um, Apolifar is a little less sensitive to temperature fluctuations than Apigard is. Uh, I think probably because you put it in all four corners, and Apigard you just put it in one place in the hive. I think in cool temperatures, the Apolife Apo bar has better coverage all over the hive than Apigard. But uh, anyway, Apolife bar is, is better in all temperatures than Apigard. Apigard is good in warm temperatures. And as you go up in toxicity, um, probably the next the next thing would be Apivar, the Apivar strips, which is Amitraz. Uh, Amitraz is a harsh chemical, and it's similar to fluvalinate. So, don't uh, don't expect don't expect Apivar strips to be effective that many more years, because mites are going to develop a tolerance to it. They, I mean, it's it's a cousin to fluvalinate. It took 15 years for mice to, to develop a tolerance to fluvalinate when the next treatment was Checkmite Plus, was Kumafos. It wasn't even related chemically to fluvalinate. It only took two years for varroa mice to develop a tolerance to, to Kumafos and organophosphate. Right now, Amitraz is, you know, Apivar. Right now, it's effective, but they're already talking about seeing some tolerance in mites up in Minnesota, Minnesota. North Dakota. So don't expect it to work. Just, in other words, if you use it, check for mites after you use it. Make sure that it works. If it didn't, use something different. And those are the chemical treatments. Kumafos is not that effective anymore. Uh, Apostan strips, fluvalinate, not that effective anymore. But uh, 
any of it's better than not doing anything. Do you treat on a regular basis, or are you checking for mites? Or I, I, treat, I treat drone colonies on a regular basis. Uh -huh. The colonies that I'm using uh, just to produce drones. To, now, they produce honey, too, but uh, <laughs> mostly to produce drones to make queens. I treat them prophylactically. I treat them by the calendar. Okay. And because I can't take a chance on not having drones. Right. So. And how often are you treating them? Just once a year? Or? No, I, I treat them. I treat them with formic acid. I give them two treatments of formic acid, uh -huh. about uh, one brood cycle apart in the spring, and then I put a hop guard strip in them, usually around the first of July, really? because that six week gives you six weeks coverage. And that gets me through August, and then I'll I will check them and see if there's any mites in them in early September. Mm -hmm. And if if I see any mites in any of them, I'll treat them with formic again okay. after it cools off in right. September. But I, I switch from one to the other back back to formic. And I do that because those are the things you can use with honey super zone, so it's less toxic and less likely to get in wax. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's a different it's a different control. It, it controls the mites in a different way. Both of them do. So uh, I use those two now in honey producing hives. I treat them once a year in the spring, and I treat those with formic in the spring, and then in the fall I check them after I take honey off when I'm getting them ready for for winter. Uh, I'll check them for mites, and if if they have any mites. I'll put a hot guard strip in them then. Okay. And I usually don't go back and check those honey producing hives again, you know, to see if the hot guard worked. Mm -hmm. But uh, I lose a few of those too. Mm -hmm. I lose I lose thirty to forty percent of those. And I can't say that it's the mite treatment or that it's any any one particular thing. Um, the reason that I lose them. But you gotta go back and look at the ones that I only lose five to ten percent of, and they're having the brood cycle broken repeatedly during the year, which removes the host for a certain period of time. And I think that probably has about as much to do with it as anything else. It's breaking that brood cycle, or that the varroa have to be exposed, you know, outside from under a cap cell. I think that has about as much to do too. Once they're exposed. If your bees are uh, either defensive or hygienic, they're likely to remove the mites from, you know, groom themselves and remove the mites from the hive once they're exposed from out, out from under the cabinets. So I think the break in the brood cycle is a big part of why we have a lot lower losses in our queen rearing hives. We should have higher losses because they're never allowed to build like they should all summer long. They don't ever get to build up. They, they're beat up all summer. But we raise a lot of queens too, queen cells. This year, everybody wants cells. People that I have been selling mated queens to are all buying cells. I don't know if their money's tight or what what the reason is, but uh, it's all right with me. I mean, that removes a lot of uh, removes a lot of anxiety for me worrying about whether or not this queen's going to get mated back to the hive and after she gets mated back to the hive she's going to be a drone layer or you know that removes a lot of uh, a lot of worry for me it's all on them and they buy a sale for seven or eight dollars and uh, unless they're one particular beekeeper and uh, he takes all of my honey off for me on the river takes it to his honey house and extracts it and puts it in drums so he gets them for three dollars a sale. <laughs> but uh, uh, one of the other guys has been buying them for actually he char I charge him eight dollars a sale. Uh, he has to pay the irritation tax. You know, for minutes on the phone and you get classified as an irritation tax. But, he pays eight dollars a sale, and he said, "How come Mike gets them for three? I heard you selling to him for three. And I said, "I am selling to him for three. He said, "Why?" And I said, "Cause I like him." You know? <laughs> <laughs> he said, "So 
I guess that tells me you don't like me. And I said, no, I like you okay, Ray. And I said, uh, it's just that Mike takes my honey off and extracts it for me and puts it in drums. I said, if you do that, I'll sell them to you for $3 a cent. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that, that's, that's how I treat for mites. I do treat the drone colonies prophylactically, the queen rearing colonies, unless I see it, see some reason to treat them. I don't, I don't treat them for mites unless I see some reason. But almost every year, and almost every hive, I'll see some reason at some point during the summer that they need treated. When they need treated, uh, I have to use something that that's not going to have an ill effect on the queens or the honey supers, which is usually hop guard. Now, when, uh, because it's too hot during the summer to use for me, but uh, when uh, you treat a hive for mites, or actually anything you do in a hive, always keep in mind that anything you do in a hive has the ability to cause queen loss. Just smoking a hive can cause queen loss. Just taking a frame out, all you gotta do is make a couple of bees mad and get the, get the queen tagged with some alarm pheromone or something and she's dead. I mean that, yeah, hey, if you take a frame out, say, say the, the queen is on two frames over and you take a frame out and there's a bee that gets its leg caught in the, in the frame and takes a fence at you, but it falls over and crawls down in between those other two frames. See, everybody knows, or most people know, that uh, alarm pheromone smells like bananas. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't smell bananas. I mean, when enough of them get mad enough at you, and they're flying around you and tagging you with this alarm pheromone to tell the rest of them this is where you need to come sting because we need to kill this guy. Uh, you'll smell bananas. It's the same chemical, isopentyl acetate. It's the same chemical that makes a banana smell that way. So. Uh, you may not smell that alarm pheromone, but the bees do. I mean, just a, just a tiny emission of alarm pheromone. This bee flops over and falls down in between these, or crawls down in between these other two frames and crawls past the queen and rubs up against her, and they'll attack her. If you put a if you put a mite control strip in a hive, and the queen crawls over it, she'll die. They'll kill her because that changes her smell enough, she becomes seen as a usurper. She's seen as a born queen because that's not how my queen smell. So anything you do in a hive has the ability to cause queen loss. It's amazing to me that it don't happen more often than it does. But uh, if you get in a hive and you, you know it's queen right, and you put it back together and the next time you come there's queen cells everywhere, don't beat yourself up thinking that, well, I must have rolled the queen or done something stupid. It just happens. It, those, those things just happen. And that's another pitch for knowing how to raise queens and for keeping a nuke for, for every colony. That's another pitch for that because you've got a fix for it, for the problem that, of being queenless. But If you spray spray oxalic acid on a hive, uh, that too can cause queen loss, or it may not because you're spraying it on all the bees and everybody's pretty much equally equally beset by oxalic acid. Commercial beekeepers have been using that for about 15 years. It's worked pretty good up until about the last three or four, and it's working less and less and less. It still kills the mites. And they use it a lot. They use it every time the hive's open. And it still kills the mites. And it's still not killing any more bees than it ever did. Problem is, the viruses that the, and bacterial diseases that mites are bringing into the hive are multiplying at a more rapid rate. With the, with the fewer, with the fewer mites to vector it in there, 
the more the faster it replicates in the hive. And I liken it to uh, when we got coyotes where we lived 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we got coyotes. Mississippi River froze over solid 1977, 78, and 79. Those three winters, Mississippi froze solid over. And those three years, we had a big influx of coyotes come, come across the river into Kentucky and Tennessee, West Tennessee. And uh, we never saw them up until about 1980, 1981. First coyote I ever saw in my life was 1981. But uh, uh, we didn't think much of it. They weren't causing any trouble. Then they got pretty thick. And uh, we started noticing loss of wildlife. They killed a few calves, a few newborn calves, but it wasn't it wasn't like total devastation or anything, but... Uh, what, 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 can, what are you saying? Toads? Coyotes. Oh, coyotes. Okay. Coyotes. Okay. Yeah, in California, okay. that'd be a coyote. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wait, how could they kill a cow? Okay. <laughs> well, these are, these are big frogs now. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to get in front of one of them. That tongue is... <laughs> but, yeah, we totally didn't know what you were saying. Well, okay. That's okay. <laughs> I, I spoke in Long Island, New York last week, and one place I spoke is actually in the city. Uh, what, this wasn't in, that particular place wasn't in Long Island. It was in the city, and everybody was just like that. And af after the thing was over with, the fellow was talking to me, and he, I said, uh, he said, what'd you think? And I said, well, it looked like everybody was really paying attention. He said, Nobody knew what you were saying. <laughs> he said they were trying to figure out what you were talking about. He said they were asking those of us that knew you, you know, what he, what he say, what he say, and uh, I said, well, that's funny. I always joke about needing an interpreter when I go north of the Ohio, and uh, he said, honestly, if you'd been speaking Mandarin, more people here would have known what you were saying. <laughs> he said they don't understand West Kentucky hillbilly talk, but. Uh, uh, we started killing coyotes, you know, started killing them, and the Department of Fish and Game did this study, and in the early 80s, the average litter size was like four, three to four, and after we killed off a whole bunch of them, the average litter size jumped to seven, six and seven, and I think that's probably pretty much what we're seeing with the viruses and bacteria that roll a vector into the highs is the the less competition there is for resources in the in the body of the bee, the more rapidly they they reproduce the viruses. I think that's what we're seeing. They're becoming systemic in the bees quicker. And then the bees feed the larva and it's just a it's just a cascade problem. But uh, that's that's the reason I don't like to take a chance on parole. Kills highs, you don't even realize they're crashing until it's too late to too late to turn it around. By the time you notice the population's down because there's not as many flying in now the hive, it's it's too late to do anything about it. Which is another reason to keep a nuke. <laughs> How many strains, if you don't mind, how many strains of queens do you run? Uh, I raise uh, two crossed, crossed varieties, and they're, I call them designer queens. And then I raise the kind that actually makes a living for you, <laughs> which is uh, uh, it's, it's a queen that I've raised for 25 years. It, it's the same line and it, it originated, for me anyway, it originated with commercial beekeepers I was working with in South Mississippi. It was their strain of bees which was basically a Minnesota hygienic that was selected. You know, they, they, they raised their own queens from their own stock. It usually started with a Minnesota hygienic because those guys were from up there, North Dakota, Minnesota. Uh, South Dakota, and 
they had a good relationship with uh, Marla's lab up there. So uh, they were they were really uh, you know accustomed to that that line of bees, and uh, they would select from the heaviest producers from the year before. And that's what they would breed from. Well, when I started, when I started raising them from their stock, uh, I was treatment free for 16 years, and I selected them by being alive <laughs> because I'd lose 75. The first five years I was treatment free, I lost 75 percent, 75 percent, 70 percent. Then it was down to like 35 percent, and then 20 percent. And you know, it eventually kind of leveled out, but that was before these viruses ever, ever uh, you know, were exhibited. You know, before they ever came up. But uh, anyway, the uh, our basic bee has a lot of Minnesota hygienic characteristics and a little bit of carniolan in it. But uh, I raise a carniolan cross with a saskatraz and then the reverse cross of that for one particular one particular group that buys all that I can uh, all that I can produce which is not many and those designer queens I might raise 500 a year and our other queens we raise about 2,000 a year. How could you get into beekeeping? Uh, purely by accident. I mean, uh, we were raising I grew up raising pro, raising uh, tobacco. Tobacco. Our family, our family has been on that farm since 1823, and we've always raised hogs and tobacco and corn. And uh, when I grew up, we, we began raising soybeans and wheat back in the 60s. And uh, it was pretty plain that the tobacco program was on the way out, so uh, I decided. By that time, I had control of what happened on the farm, managing the farm, and I sold the tobacco base and started raising. I was looking for something on small acreage, relatively small acreage, that was return similar to tobacco. So I started raising produce, and uh, I wasn't aiming for that to be as much work as it was. I thought it couldn't be any more work than tobacco. Well, I was wrong about that. And that's just one of the many things I've been wrong about. But part of the produce was two acres of yellow squash that I raised for a broker. And the squash had to have a pollinator. And, uh, melons and cucurbits have a male bloom and a female bloom. And they have to have pollen moved manually from one bloom to another, uh, or they won't produce. And so I had to have bees. Well, I, uh, I just, uh, I'd come out of a, a business and lifestyle where the adrenaline was like this, you know, and I really missed that adrenaline rush. And I thought, I gotta have bees anyway, and that might be just crazy enough to give me this same adrenaline rush, and it, it still does. But uh, when you're on the edge of being killed every minute, you know, <laughs> you think, man, this. Uh, makes a hair on my neck stand up. But uh, anyway, I knew a beekeeper that I grew up helping him work in tobacco too. And I knew that he had a peach orchard and he had bees. And I asked him, he, he only lived about five miles from me, and I asked him about getting bees. And I actually traded barn space, because we'd quit raising tobacco. I traded barn space for his tobacco that year for a couple of hives of bees. And that was my first lesson in bees. In September, when he brought the tobacco over there, I said, uh, I'm ready for my bees. He said, no, you don't want your bees now. I said, no, wait a minute. You got your barn space. I want my bees. He said, uh, trust me, you don't want your bees now. I said, why not? And uh, he said, let me take a chance on getting them through the winter alive. I, said, I thought bees just kind of existed. And he said, well, you've got a lot of learning to do. And uh, that was that was thirty something years ago, and I've still got a lot of learning to do. But anyway, that there's some things that you raise and produce that people will come from town to your place out in the middle of nowhere to buy. 
uh, tomatoes and sweet corn. They'll come to your place to buy them where I live. And I found out pretty quick that they've come out there for hunting too. So it was just kind of a natural segue mm -hmm. into uh, uh, as more people in our area got out of tobacco and into produce, I wasn't willing to compete with my neighbors for the produce market, but none of them wanted to fool with bees because those things are stinging. So I just went more into bees. I had three hives one year, 17 the next, 51 the next, 88 the next, and uh, then I had 44 because I got American Fowl Proof. And that was another learning session. And uh, after that episode, uh, I got back to 90 highs, and that made me learn how to make bees. Forced me to learn how to make bees, and I went to work for a commercial beekeeper in East Texas that paid in bees. And uh, <clears throat> I learned a lot about how to make bees, how to make queens, how to, it, it was right, right then, I mean, the first year I worked for him, I realized this is what I want to do. This is pretty cool. And uh, there again, I, I underestimated how much work there was involved in it. I found that, uh, for me anyway, the stopping point for numbers of hives that I can, that I can manage, if you're just talking about managing for honey production, is about 400. I can manage 400 hives and do a good job of it. But well, when how it gets, many acres? Well, they cover a whole lot of acres. Yeah, I was going to say. But uh, now our queen rearing hives is a whole different, a whole different thing, and I can manage about 400 of those. But that, that's it. I mean, that's uh, I have one guy that helps me, and another guy that's part time, and. I can't, I can't do any more than that. At one time I had 1,200 highs and I had, I was pollinating watermelons and uh, I had another full-time fella that helped with that. But uh, that, that's all water under the bridge. But anyway, I went to work for the commercial beekeeper, learned how to make bees, learned how to make queens, and uh, learned a whole lot from him. Then I went kind of out on my own and wound up in South Mississippi. Made a lot of connections down there with other commercial beekeepers and uh, have, have worked as a consultant for two of those guys ever since. And they don't pay me anything, but they will answer my phone call at supper time. And if I need something, I mean, where I live, uh, if somebody wants to get bees and they cannot find bees anywhere else, they call me, and it's not that I have bees, it's that I know people that do. And those are those commercial guys that feel like they owe me something, and uh, I call them. And really what it amounts to, if everybody works together, I mean, you can benefit one another by, just by working together and sharing resources when you have them and leaning on other people when you don't. That's kind of what the commercial business is about in, in, in one way. And then the other way, they'll steal all your bees from you. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Well, we're done here if y'all don't have any other questions. But, uh, Are you an entomologist? Uh, I'm, a, I'm an ologist or something, but I don't, not that. I, I, I was happy to get out of high school. When I got out of high school, I didn't need to go to college because I already knew more than all the teachers did, according to me. I, that's another thing I was wrong about. But uh, no, I, I never. I have a, I have a, the curse of a near perfect memory, and uh, people think that that's that's a great asset, but. Uh, you think that until you can't forget the stuff you've messed up at. <laughs> but well, I also wondered if you were a SEAL. Were you a SEAL? No. no. I was an outlaw. An outlaw. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, every, in every sense of the word. Yeah. But see, uh, this is another thing that people don't understand about outlaws. 
the smart outlaws don't ever do anything wrong at home. But you can get a couple hundred miles from home and do whatever you need to do. Nobody, everybody at home thinks you're a preacher still. You know, but, but I'm not an outlaw anymore, or any less either.